Okay. Um, Dr. Simon is next. He is the Adult CF Center Director, and like I mentioned before, his part of the center is bigger than mine, which speaks volume of the quality of life and, and the number of patients that are doing much better. So, Dr. Simon. Thank you. I always look forward to this evening. Um, for those of you who were here last year, you might note that the title of what I'm going to talk about is very similar to last year's. And the reason is that the advances that have been made just in the last 12 months in modulators has been really amazing, and that you, many of you have probably already heard about the triple combination. And I wanted to spend some time sort of going once more through the background, what are these medications doing, and then also spend time showing you what the data are currently and why we're so excited about it, and sort of give you a timeline of when, if everything goes as we all hope it does, that it might become available. Okay, so the modulators are, the, the ones that are currently available are Ivacaftor, Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, those last two are combinations of two, and then the triple combination drugs that I'll get to shortly. But I thought it worthwhile spending a little time once more about why we need these modulators, what they're doing, and why there's so much promise with it. So this is just showing you the uh, a diagram of a lung, and there's an airway that's been opened up. And if you look down on the surface of the airway, you can see what would look, things would look like in a scanning electron microscope. These little hair-like structures are called cilia, and they're very important of keeping the lung clean. If something is inhaled, they're partially responsible for getting rid of it. And the way these cilia work, and this is just showing a single one, these cilia can beat back and forth, and that they take a mucus layer, which is shown there, and they move it out of the lung with any of the bacteria or particles that are trapped in it to get them out of the lung so they don't set up shop and get into trouble there. In order for these cilia to work, there has to be a layer of fluid where they can wave back and forth so the mucus floats on it. And that layer of mucus is very important because without it, then the system doesn't work. And this is just showing you a representation. This is what, it should, um, what things should look like on the left where the cilia are beating back and forth and the green is mucus on it. But we know that in cystic fibrosis, because of the underlying genetic problem, there's difficulty in that the airway surface gets dried out. There's not enough liquid there. Those cilia can't beat, so they can't get the mucus and move it out of the lungs. And the mucus, in fact, gets stuck there. It builds up to a large amount. And it can also set up the environment where infection can occur. So the goal is to try to reverse this problem, that is having not enough fluid on the surface of the airway. So what does this have to do with cystic fibrosis? How does this cause that problem when that leads to that dehydration? So in this bottom right is showing you a cross section of the cells. Again, those green, those are the cilia that can wave back and forth. But that orange line that's sitting right on the surface, that's the CF protein. That's a protein that needs to be there so that the right amount of fluid is present on top of the cells. I've drawn what the CF protein looks like here. Everything in yellow on this right-hand panel is part of the CF protein. It actually forms a channel right on the surface of the cell, and the bicarbonate and chloride can go in and out of that. And it turns out that's very important for the right amount of fluid to be there because the amount of salt that's out on the surface of the lung determines how much fluid is there, and the CF protein is critical for allowing the right amount to be there. Now, this pore that's there that allows the chloride and bicarbonate to go in and out, it's not a channel that's opened all the time, it's actually gated, and most of what you see below here is a system that involves with opening and closing the gate so it's open in the right amount of time there. So we know a whole lot about this protein. This is just another way of showing that protein rather than that drawing. This is actually showing what the amino acid chain looks like, and we know a huge amount about it there. This is the part that forms the, the, the pore, and all of this is controlling the opening and closing of the pore. And we know what each one of these small building blocks is for this. 
we can look at this then, so what has to work correctly in order for the right amount of fluid to be out there? And this is just another way of depicting it, where this is just one of those cells. The cilia that aren't shown on the top here, but within the nucleus is the DNA, and that has the CF gene. When the CF gene is working correctly, it's a normal CF gene, the cell uses that information to make a protein and that protein then has to be able to process, make it all the way up to the surface of the cell to form that channel. And this is just another way to show it. There's the channel, and this is the machinery that's there to open and close it. And so when everything is working, the DNA is working properly, the protein is made, it makes it up to the surface, the channel is there, and the channel opens when it's supposed to, we end up with the right amount of chloride on the surface, and that's necessary for the right amount of fluid to be out there. But we know, obviously, that this protein doesn't work all the time, and it doesn't work all the time because of mutations in the DNA. Because the protein is made using information from the DNA, and if the DNA has an error in it, the protein that is made is incorrect. Now we know from over the years studying it, there's over 2,000 different ways errors can occur in the DNA, and so they are all different ways that the protein can be made incorrectly, depending on the mutations there. I'm going to tell you about the G551D mutation. This is a mutation, it's in just, whoops, oh boy, <laughs> didn't need that. So this is a mutation that ends up, it's in the DNA, but the protein is made incorrectly, and it's just one very small place in it. But it turns out for many of these mutations, one small change causes a whole lot of troubles. And in this case, with this G551D mutation, it prevents everything from working correctly. So this is, again, is showing you that same diagram, but this time I've shown you that there's a block there, that red square there. That's what's caused by that G551 mutation. It blocks it up, it closes the gate, the gate doesn't open. And if the gate doesn't open, then chloride and bicarbonate can't go in and out. So you've got a dysfunctional protein, it doesn't contribute anything, and so that leads down the line to having that dried out airway surface there. So the question is, what can you do to be able to correct this abnormality? And that's when these modulators come, come in. Just showing you again what's happening with this G551D mutation is the gene is there, but it has an error in it. So when the protein is made and it makes it up to the surface, the channel is there, but that channel stays closed. The gate stays closed and it's not working. So the idea was, can we find a drug that we could give to patients with cystic fibrosis with this mutation, and would that drug open the gate? So it would hold the gate open and allow the CF protein to function like it's supposed to function. And so the way they did it is, it's this huge robotic system where they have tons of different chemicals they want to test. You can grow in the laboratory cells that have different mutations and you can test huge numbers of chemicals to see if any of them might open the gate. And of course, as you know, I wouldn't be talking about this. The answer was yes, and that's Ivacaftor. You may note it as Kaleidico, the brand name of it there. Because when patients with this mutation and a small additional number of mutations as well, when they take Ivacaftor, that small little molecule interacts with the G551D protein, and it holds the gate open so it can function again. Now, we've known about this for quite a while. In fact, the Ivacaftor, I think, was 2012 that it was approved. But unfortunately, it's just a small number of people relative to everyone with cystic fibrosis that have the right mutations that Ivacaftor by itself will work. It's only about 5%. In those 5%, it's been fantastic for them, but it's not the rest of the patients with CF. We want it for everyone. So it turns out that when they tried Ivacaftor in patients with this G551D, it was hugely successful. And there's a number of different ways you could show this. It's easiest to show you with a breathing test. This is FEV1 that most of you know about because that's what's tested routinely when people with CF come into clinic. But you can see that when they were testing Ivacaftor, 
If the patients were on placebo, sugar pill, didn't do anything, it didn't increase the, the FEV1. But very shortly after patients with this mutation started Ivacaftor, there was a big jump in FEV1, and it stayed up for the duration for 48 weeks, which is what, of course, everyone wanted to do. Now, FEV1 is a measure, but these studies showed that there were a lot of other benefits. Dr. Caverly just showed you that for infection and inflammation, there's benefits from it, and there's also quality of life. Um, measures that show that it also has helped that hugely. So it's not just FEV1, people feel better, and it appears to hold up, at least for this study, for the duration they're taking it. And then subsequent follow-on studies show that that improvement seems to be maintained over time. But what we really want is to get this for everyone with cystic fibrosis. So the other mutation that's being particularly targeted this one called F508 Del or Delta F508. The reason for choosing this is that it's a real common mutation. Almost 90% of people with cystic fibrosis in this country have at least one copy of this mutation. In fact, half the people in this country have two copies of it. So if we could find a drug similarly that would work as well as Ivacaftor does for that other set of mutations, we would really be a giant head, we would be ahead hugely with that there. So using that same strategy, that in fact there have been drugs that have come out to be able to, to help. The abnormality in the Delta F508 mutation is that it's again an abnormality in the DNA and it gives the wrong information to the protein that's made. But the protein that's made with this mutation, its problem is that it can't be processed correctly. As proteins are synthesized, they need to be folded up correctly so they form that channel and get to the right place. But just as one really small mut um, abnormality that's from this Delta F508 mutation, that it prevents the folding from occurring, that protein never makes it up to the surface of the cell. No channel is formed, doesn't matter whether it's gated or not, it's not gonna work. Incidentally, we do know if you can fool the cell in the laboratory to allow that abnormal protein to get up to the surface, it turns out that that also has a gating problem. The gate won't open. And so when you see all of these medications that are used for Delta F508, they will have one medication, but they also have that Ivacaftor. That's the one that opens up the gate and holds it. That's why there's those two sets of, of, of medications always together for Delta F508 treatment here. So as you know that we've had a medication that helps with that folding. The first one was Lumacaftor combined with Ivacaftor, that's Orcambi. And then subsequently, just a year or so ago, that there was also approved Tezacaftor Ivacaftor, that's Simdico. Because I'll just show you a little bit of data on this last one here. But this also is shown to help get the Delta F508 folded correctly so it can make it up to the surface and so the Ivacaftor then can then hold it up. And when you look at the data, and I'll just show you FEV1 data, that too helped everything. Which just shows you that at the time when patients remained on placebo, in fact, over time that during the trial, they actually deteriorated a little bit. But those people who were on the Tezacaftor Ivacaftor combination had a very quick jump up, and it lasted for the duration of the trial, in, in this time, 24 weeks there. But for those of you who are astute and are comparing and looking at numbers, this, this medication definitely helps, but it wasn't the home run we were looking for. What I did is I took the data that I showed you on the previous slide, and then I put it on top of that earlier Ivacaftor slide. So you can get an idea, how much does this combination duplicate what we saw with the, with the G551D? And although this is an important increase that was seen here, it's not what we all were hoping for to get it all the way up to the Ivacaftor level. So because it became very apparent that this wasn't gonna be everything we wanted it to be, that research did not stop, and there was still a lot of work going on to try to find additional treatments. And what we now know about this triple combination that we're talking about, that is looking at these two new compounds, VX 
um, 659 and VX445, because these are what are part of the triple combination. Because both of them help fold that delta 508 correctly. So when it gets made, it makes it up to the surface, the channel is there, and if you give Ivacaftor to it as well, that channel can function. So in that circumstance, there have now been studies, and I think th when I talked last year, we just had a little bit of preliminary data, but not very much. But now we have a lot more data here. With these triple combinations, there's actually two different sets of experiments going on. Both of them use the tezacaftor ivacaftor, that's the Simdico medication, but then they add either VX659 or VX445 to it. So we've got three medications, two that help with the folding, one that holds the gate open there. And they're testing it in a number of different patient groups, but importantly, they're testing it in people who have two copies of Delta 508, that's about 50% of people in this country, and they're also testing it in people who have just one copy of Delta F508, and the second mutation that's there we know doesn't do anything, and it's unlikely to respond, so they're really seeing whether this is powerful enough to help with people who have just one copy of Delta F508, because Simdico and Orcambi, although they help when you have two, they didn't help enough with just one copy. So that's why the 40% of people who just have one copy have not had access to these medications, because when tested, they just didn't make a big enough improvement. But so we've got these triple combinations, and they're being tested against two copies of Delta F508 and just one copy. And so these studies have been going on. The 659 has been completed. The 445 is still going on at the present time. But, the, but we got information, we got a snapshot of what's going on early. Because even though these studies went on for 24 weeks, everyone who entered the study had to stay on it for 24 weeks. That they looked early on at four weeks to see, are these doing what they need to be? And so this is one, this is looking at the triple combination with 659 and the triple combination with 445. And they're looking just at four weeks, it's early on, but they're looking to see what happened to the FEV1. And this is Delta 508, two copies, and it increased 10% actually with both of these triple combinations. It's almost the same. And remember, these people were already on the tezacaftor ivacaftor, so they already have a few percent increase, and this is 10% above that, and that's really big. But what really is and additionally exciting is they tested it if there was just one copy of Delta F508, because people had not been able to get a, a medicine that was effective yet. And in this time, when they looked at just four weeks with both triple combination, it was almost 14% improvement in FEV1. And that is just huge. I think just to put it into context, I put everything on top of each other now so you can get an idea why everyone's so excited about this. I've got, this is the data that I just showed you, and this is the early four-week data. But you can see in people that, um, uh, that when you take that, it's a 14% improvement. So it's even better than the Ivacaftor was for those early patients that were lucky enough to get it. So this is really big, and everyone is very, very excited about it. So where are we in this? What does this mean? So I've already intimated. This is looking at the full, the full circle is everyone in this country with cystic fibrosis, and it breaks it down based on their groups of mutations that they have. So the Ivacaftor for that small gating population that runs it look really good, it was only about 8% were getting the full benefits. They've done very well over the last you know, um, five, six years have, when they've been on it. But that the, the group that then became eligible for the Tezacaftor Ivacaftor or the Lumacaftor Ivacaftor, it was this 46%. Now I showed you there was definite improvement and that's why we were all enthusiastic about making it available to people. But really the ones that got the really highly effective treatment up until the present time have been really the small number of patients here. All of these benefited from it, from the other combinations, but it isn't what we were all hoping for as, the, as, as one of the endpoints. 
So, but what does this mean then for if the triple combinations, if they're proved safe, we don't know that yet, we hope that's the case, and that they then decide which one they're gonna carry forward, what will be the circumstances then? Well, that all these groups here are gonna have available highly effective modulator therapy, um, as opposed to just really this small triangle down at the bottom here, and that's what we're all aiming for. So I know you're all sitting there. The next question is when, when, when? And so it's never as soon as we want, but this is the current estimates, and these are just estimates, and they're based on the company putting out press releases that give some indication of where we are in the system here. So preliminary data report, we've got that preliminary data. I showed you that four week support. That's why we're all so excited there. And the first one came out, the 659, uh, in November, and it was just a month ago that the 445 data was reported there. Now, according to the company that's making this, they anticipate they'll have the complete data report and be, that's all the benefits and side effects. And that will, they'll make it available. And they talk in, 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 in business terms, it's in the second quarter of 2019. That means sometimes during April and June that they should give us the full information. But they will also at that time tell us which one they're carrying forward. Are they choosing 445 or are they choosing 659? And we should know it somewhere in there. But then when they, do, when they have this, they then need to apply to the different regulatory agencies. It's the FDA here in the United States. There's a European equivalent to it. And they have said that they're going to get, have the, everything together and sent to the FDA in the third quarter of 2019. That's what their press release says. And so I've written down third quarter is July through September. So hopefully it will be submitted at that point in time. There'll be no holdups. It then depends on how long the FDA needs to look at all this because they don't want to release it to everyone if it turns out that it's not safe. And that's one of the things they'll look at. All the preliminary data says it will be effective, but the issue is whether it's safe. And that's what they look at so carefully. With a drug like this, I would hope they would get it through in three months. They frequently do that but that we can't tell. If they see something in it, they need more information, it's gonna go longer than that. So what people are talking about who have some information about this, that it's likely that sometime in relatively early 2020, if everything goes perfectly, and I'm saying if, 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 has to be safe, the FDA has to be comfortable it's safe, that it would be probably January, February, March at the latest in 2020, that it would become available to us there. So what does this all mean? Um, I've just shown you, we've already seen what the predicted survival is in patients with cystic fibrosis, going back, as Dr. Keverly showed, to 1938 when, when it was first described, where almost no one made it out of infancy for a whole variety of reasons. But you can see the survival has been fairly steady going up over the years. But you notice this little jog up here at the end. When it was that first dot, everyone said, well, it may just be an accident. But now we have two years of data that have, sh oops, that have shown this, uh, this jog up here. Um, everyone would like to believe it's the early effect of having these modulators available, as well as all the other good treatments that we have. We will know, you know in a year whether or not this is real and going up. But I think everyone's prediction will be that if these modulators that can affect so many people, if in fact they're, they're available, they're proof safe, that we believe that we're gonna have this continue to go up and whether or not it reaches normal lifespan, that's a, yeah, everyone would wish that, probably not yet, but that it's gonna be a major jump up. So you can see why everyone's excited about it. I certainly am too. I keep saying ifs, but I can't help my enthusiasm over this. So just wanted to share all this with you. I wish it were tomorrow. It isn't gonna be. It's gonna be more, not hopefully less than a year, but this is what we're all hoping for. Now, just as an aside, there are people, it's about 10% of people with CF that won't be eligible for these because their mutations we know won't benefit from it. The CF Foundation is spending millions of dollars coming with alternative treatments for it, but they're earlier in the pipeline. We've got a ways to go for them. 
but if you have a family, if you're part of a family that has these that won't be eligible for it, rest assured that there's huge amounts of efforts to be able to get treatments for, for everyone so that everyone can benefit from these. Okay, thank you.